So welcome all. Uh, we have discussed the downsampling of images and uh, now I want to talk about upsampling or more generally speaking interpolation. Uh, you need interpolation when you upsample an image or when you resample an image or even if you only want to rotate an image. So rotation by 90 degrees is easy uh, because then uh, pixels get mapped onto pixels. But if you want to rotate by angles other than 90 degrees, if you think of it a little, um, the new locations will end up somewhere in between the old ones. And you need you know, uh, some means of uh, finding that rotated image. Um, so how can we do that? I again start with a one dimensional example. So I'm having here, I'm considering a signal G with just four samples. And uh, let's say I want to upsample it to twice its length. So I want to get out a signal with eight samples. And well, you know, I've invented here um, some matrix on how to do that. Um, I have multiplied here with an eight by four matrix from the left. And uh, it looks a little bit like a diagonal matrix, except I mean, we have, you know, if we squint, we see ones running down this uh, weird diagonal. Um, but in fact, here, you know, I've replicated uh, every other row. Um, so my interpolation result here would be to repeat G1, to repeat G2, repeat G3, and so on. Um, but in terms of an interpolation, um, this gives you a piecewise constant signal. And maybe we want something smoother. Uh, then we can argue, should this smoother interpolated result well, should it be an interpolation or not? Do you want to reproduce the original values or not? Um, and we know from downsampling that the original values, um, they are not sacrosanct. You know, they, they in themselves may have originated from some smoothing operation, um, but we don't know how they were generated in general. And so in most cases, um, the idea is that you do want to interpolate. So if I um, call this here my matrix M and I call this my signal G, then uh, I want the condition circled here in red to hold. Um, if I plot it as a matrix, um, this means that I'm looking for a matrix M um, in which every second row is fixed. So um, in every second row I want a one for the measurement that I want to preserve and zeros everywhere else. And I filled this matrix with question marks just to say that, you know, we have artistic freedom um, of how exactly do we want to do that. And uh, one particular choice was given above. I have replicated each second line. Uh, another choice is shown here on the right hand side. Um, rather than replicate a signal yeah, I'm truly interpolating, I would say, in the sense that here I take a weighted uh, average of uh, the left sample and the right sample and so on. But there are many other choices. Yeah, so if I uh, plot it not as a matrix, but as a, but as a graph, um, then uh, the zeros and ones from this matrix um, that we saw here, I have now just plotted in terms of red dots and uh, in principle, you know, we are free to do anything. Yeah, so I should go through this point, but then I could do something really weird as long as I go through the next red point. And I could do something really weird as long as I go through the, red, red, the next red point, etc. Now this blue, you know, thing that I've drawn here, that's not a very plausible interpolation filter, we all agree. Uh, but what is a plausible filter? Um, and I've marked here two. Um, the first one that I've marked is um, this purple box filter, which has been shifted a little bit. This purple box filter, well, I chose purple because uh, this is what I used up here for the mask. So um, if you think for a little, if I take my original signal, um, so my original signal, um, 
here would be uh, g of 0, here would be g of 1, here would be g of 2. Uh, and if I convolve my original signal with this uh, purple mask, then I obtain, that's equivalent to the upsampling suggestion I made first. Um, on the other hand, the suggestion which I liked a lot better here, this more symmetrical one, the green one, is also shown here in terms of a filter. Uh, that's this uh, triangle filter or tent filter that you show uh, that you see here in green. Um, but you know, as I just pointed out, there are many, many other choices, and which one, uh, which one should we use? Um, now, in fact, this uh, purple box uh, which I first showed, uh, so I, I showed this uh, purple filter. Let's see if I can get purple. All right, the purple filter that was a box filter, except I used a shifted version above. Uh, and then I used uh, green uh, to show this uh, tent filter. So it's exactly zero up to here, and then goes like that, and like that, and so on. And these are two members of a family, um, namely a family that you uh, obtain uh, when you take a box filter and convolve it with itself. Yeah, so uh, this is the box filter. Um, this is sometimes abbreviated with a capital pi, just because the letter capital pi looks a little bit like a box. Um, this here is obtained by uh, convolving the box filter with itself. You see the box filter itself had a support that went from uh, minus one half to plus one half, so it had a support of one. If we convolve it with itself, we get something with a support of two. Indeed, this green mask um, is zero uh, or is non-zero between minus one and plus one, so it has a support of the length two. And uh, then the next filter here, um, this one would be obtained by convolving the box filter with itself um, three times. And the final one, which already, you know, it looks pretty Gaussian to our eye, is obtained by convolving the box filter with itself four times. Of course, it is not Gaussian because we can strictly compute uh, its support. So its support is going to be only from minus 2 to plus 2. And uh, this very smooth looking filter, let me highlight it here. So this smooth looking filter, it's unlike the Gaussian, it's strictly zero beyond this point. So it's, uh, you know, it's a nice filter because it looks Gaussian and yet it has a very, it has a finite support. Um, so these two filters that I showed, they are members of this family um, of, um, well, weight functions that uh, can be called these blinds. Um, now, however, um, the purple filter that I showed and the green filter that I showed, um, they are interpolating filters because they fulfill the condition that they go through one here, and they go through zero there, and they are zero at the other places. Now these other filters that I've just shown, um, like this one here, you know, I can sample it here, um, I can sample it there, and there, and you see that uh, this cannot be an interpolation filter, because for it to be an interpolation filter, it would have to be zero at this location, and yet it is not. Yeah, so it is a smoothing filter, not an interpolation filter. But what if you do want interpolation after all? So um, one way to look at it is uh, as follows. You say, I want my um, continuous signal. I want to express my interpolated, my continuous signal as a combination of a finite number of continuous filters. Yeah, so this thing is continuous. That thing, that's my filter mask, uh, which is continuous. 
and uh, I take a finite number of these and I multiply each one of them with a discrete coefficient, so just a scalar number. However, we have just seen that uh, this filter small b um, is not interpolating, if we use a b-spline of higher order, it's a smoothing filter. Um, so we need to account for this. And then we can again use the interpolation condition. Um, so I've written it down here. G is a vector, C is a vector, B is now uh, a matrix, a triplets matrix, um, holding in its rows the filter coefficients. And then I can solve for these filter coefficients. So that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is that this thing here is a smoothing filter, so a low pass filter. And to compensate for its smoothing, um, we need something which is high pass. And uh, these high pass filters, um, or coefficients here, C, we obtain them from the original, not interpolated signal, um, by this operation. So if B is a so if B is a low pass filter, then the inverse of B, B to the minus one, is a high pass filter. Now it looks like uh, when you have a very long signal, so let's say G has a million samples, uh, that it looks like you need to uh, invert a million by a million matrix, and that you know would of course be uh, super expensive if we do it naively. However, um, capital B is triplets, or circulant even, and then um, its inverse is also triplets. And it turns out that we don't need to use here general matrix inversion routines, but um, that we can uh, implement this inversion um, simply in terms of an IIR filter. IIR stands for infinite impulse response, And this is a very elegant uh, and intriguing class of filters. Um, so far, we have been discussing uh, FIR filters or finite impulse response filters. And well, uh, in a finite impulse response filter, what we did was uh, something like that. We, we said, uh, if I have a filter result, let's call it H at position L, this was given by um, some coefficients, uh, maybe alpha, excuse me, alpha times my input g at location L, plus perhaps a coefficient beta times my input g at location L minus one. Um, that's not a minus, that's a times. Um, plus, you know, if you want another filter coefficient, uh, perhaps we had. Uh, gamma times G of L minus two. So that would be a finite impulse response filters and these alpha, beta and gamma are these coefficients which we have uh, drawn many times. Um, now that would be uh, an FIR filter, finite impulse response. Uh, however, we can add a recursive or a re recurrent, recursive, I always mix these up. We can add another term here. Um, for example, I can say plus delta times h of l minus 1. Yeah, so now I have uh, h, that's my result, on the left, and I have h, the previous result, on the right. And uh, this thing here is called an infinite impulse response contribution. Why? Uh, because, for example, if we said um, alpha to one, and if we set beta and gamma to zero, and if we set delta to, let's say, 0 0.9, um, then uh, we can pause a little and think for an input g, what will my output h look like? I'm going to pause the recording. You can think about this for a moment. 
I hope I did. Um, all right. So um, you are completely right. So we have, uh, you see, um, so actually we set a beta and gamma to zero. So it means we've forgotten about this. We've forgotten about that. It's a filter which is super, you know, compact to write down. And yet its impulse response is infinite. Yeah? So we have realized a huge filter um, by a very, very, uh, by, a comp by an operation that is super compact in space. This is fantastic. Yeah? Um, now, the one disadvantage it has, well, this filter is very asymmetric. Yeah? And in image processing, for example, if we want a smoothing filter, we would usually want something you know, that's symmetric, so that uh, you know, gives us lobes on both sides. Um, now, you can think of it, what would we do? Um, well, on the 1D signal, we can run this infinite impulse response filter in one direction, and we can run it in the other direction. And if we do that, uh, then, well, we convolve a left-sided exponential decay with a right-sided exponential decay, and we obtain something symmetric, um, but still quite peaky in the middle. Uh, if I want to approximate, for example, a Gaussian filter, well, then I would take this and then I would again um, convolve from the left and from the right with infinite impulse response. And um, we thus get um, filters with very broad spatial support for extremely small computational cost. Um, and actually, these filters are not very widely known um, in image processing. Um, and well, such filters could be used to, um, I mean, yes, experts do know them, but, but uh, many people that should know them don't know them. Um, and uh, of course, you cannot just do exponential decays, but you can create way more complicated filters. Um, to understand these, um, you don't need um, the Fourier transform, but you need the Z transform. And uh, further down in the notes, I give you a reference to a nice book. Of course, there are many books on the subject. Um, so to uh, just as a side comment, so there are three ways of implementing um, convolutions. Um, there is um, the traditional way of implementing a finite impulse response filter in space. So this is just by you know, literally implementing the formula for convolution that works well for small filters. Um, for large filters, it is better to either implement them or approximate them with infinite impulse response filters or to um, do the operation in the Fourier domain because you can uh, 1D signal you can map to Fourier domain with a cost of n log n, and you know, convolution in the spatial domain amounts to multiplication in the Fourier domain, um, which is O of n, and then you inverse transform the result. Yeah? So there, there's these three ways um, to perform convolution, FIR, IIR, or in the Fourier domain. Good. Now, it turns out, as I said, that um, this uh, high pass filtering here, you don't need to actually invert this uh, triplets matrix capital B, but instead uh, you can implement this cleverly in terms of an infinite impulse response filter. And um, I'm showing you the effect here um, in a classical paper from Michael Unza. Um, he's a great uh, signal and image processing expert from Lausanne. And by the way, he was in Heidelberg um, two years or so ago um, as, uh, as a visiting professor for a semester on his sabbatical, great mathematician. Um, shown here is the uh, B-spline filter. So these are its uh, coefficients. And well, actually, I'm going to um, to make the plot more consistent with the one on the bottom. Um, I am going to, yeah, this is fine. All right, so the, um, these are the coefficients. 
And for this to be an interpolation filter, this should be zero. Should be zero for interpolation. So on the left is the filter, on the right is its um, spectral response. Yeah? So here we have a location L and uh, here we have a frequency, whatever, call it K or something. Excuse me, K, K, good. Um, now, so this amounts to using this matrix uh, B. Uh, but if, on the other hand, um, you use this high pass filtering first, then using here my low pass filter, combining it with the high pass filter, I get a um, I get a new effective filter, which uh, here on the right hand side I've called a capital K of this equation. And this effective filter is shown here. So this effective filter now has zero crossings at all the required locations. So it's one here and it has zero crossings where we want them. Um, this is a filter which uh, has infinite support. Uh, but it decays uh, uh, faster than the sink. So the sink decays as 1 over x or 1 over l, and this one here decays much faster. And on the right-hand side, you see it in the spectral domain. Um, the perfect uh, band pass filter uh, is given by this dotted line, and the um, frequency response of this b spline filter is uh, shown here. So it's a pretty good approximation to a perfect band pass at very little cost. So if you're serious about this kind of, uh, you know, implementing such an operation well, um, <clears throat> then uh, B splines would be my recommendation. And you can read all about it here in this paper and the companion paper part two. Um, now, if on the other hand, uh, you know, we want something simple, something that we can give as exercise to you and, uh, you know, without you having to work on this for a week, um, then we use something simpler like uh, the Lanchos filter that you've uh, seen or that you are seeing in your exercise. Um, this uh, Lanchos filter also looks like, uh, also looks a little bit like, or it's also an approximation to the sink. Uh, except that the Lanchos has strictly finite support, and then we can implement it very simply by means of an FIR, a finite impulse response filtering operation. Good. Now here um, uh, I have a nice uh, paper um, from uh, Pascal de Troyer. And uh, you know, when you have time, uh, why don't you click on this link? Uh, because these, uh, this journal, uh, image processing online. I like it a lot. Um, it uh, always has the article and then there is a demo section and um, then you can try these uh, things out for yourself. You can also uh, upload an image of your own <clears throat> and uh, then you can uh, try out um, these algorithms and, um, and then look at uh, the result and uh, at any differences uh, that you see. Um, and this doesn't come so well across now the network stream, I think, which is why it's better for you to um, try it out at home. Um, however, in this paper, um, two, if you wish, extreme cases are studied. Um, so the first one uh, here looks at a piecewise constant signal, and we want to interpolate it. And you see here the effect of different uh, um, interpolation methods. The sink, the perfect low pass, uh, as you see, produces these ripples far away from uh, the actual boundary. On the other hand, the sink does very well on data that does look wavy. Yeah? So um, here, the exact signal is wavy. And then the sink does uh, you know, a very good job on this one. Uh, on the other hand, we have filters uh, such as the cubic B-spline which would be my favorite, I think, my subjective favorite, or maybe even the bilinear, who knows. No? 
uh, could be my favorite for interpolating uh, this piecewise constant signal, uh, but it doesn't do so well when the signal is wavy. Yeah? So what do we do? Uh, subjectively, our preferred filter will depend on the image content. And uh, so to get better than uh, any of these convolutional methods, we need something that adapts to image content. And just by the way, um, so here's my favorite te textbook for the Z transform written at the very bottom. Good, so what do we do um, to make it depend on the image content? Well, uh, we take something like a neural network. Uh, and uh, let's just look at this picture here. Um, here is an original image, and you see this part, which has been magnified uh, over there. The image was downsampled and then upsampled. And uh, here you see the, so that's the desired result. Then um, here is what you get if you use a um, convolution filter. And uh, if, on the other hand, you use many uh, pairs of uh, downsampled images and the original high resolution one, so you um, you can create as much ground truth as you want by taking high resolution image, downsampling it, and then try and reconstruct the high resolution image from the low resolution image. That's a standard uh, training task for neural network. And well, in this case, a neural network, you know, it gives you this, um, looks much crisper or closer to the desired original than just a convolution filter. And uh, well, then you can try it on other data. Uh, okay, I did not copy the picture here. Um, you know, this is, I'm not saying that this is my favorite paper or anything. This is just you know, one of the early important papers that, that showed that this worked better. So essentially the network um, tries and recognize locally, is this image locally piecewise constant or is this image locally wavy? And then it adjusts its uh, response or its local interpolation method to that. And uh, Okay, it, it does take training, so you need a GPU to train such a thing, uh, but once it's trained, it will give you better results. Good. Um, at this point, I'll stop the recording and take any questions that you have.